All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. Uh, my name is Matt Battaglia. I'm the technical art lead at NetherRealm Studios. Um, this is uh, Bloody Production Talk in Mortal Kombat 11. A uh, quick shout out to my colleague, Aaron Voorhees. A lot of the work you're about to see in, the pre in this presentation is uh, his, uh, and he allowed me to share it. So, <clears throat> uh, We're so from NetherRealm. We're from Chicago, Illinois. We're the original creative team behind Mortal Kombat and Injustice, so big 25-year history of making these fighting games. Uh, and today we really want to focus on uh, some of the new pipelines we developed uh, based around Houdini. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of quick backstory here. Um, we're always trying to be forward looking, trying to evaluate new software, new tools, new pipelines. So um, our games, uh, we have a wide variety of challenges, especially for fatalities, for example. There's all kinds of weird stuff thrown our way. So any opportunity we have to find uh, new tools in our arsenal to solve those problems, um, that's one of the things that we tackle. So we started looking into Houdini in 2016 um, as just kind of a supplement to our VFX and our pipelines, and it rapidly became one of the cornerstones, as you're about to see. Uh, it was exciting, sometimes intimidating. It was always fun. So we're still kind of humbled by some of the stuff we see other people doing. Um, but you know, it was looking back, um, it's incredible to see how far we came and just look back and all the different use cases that we came up with. So we wanted to come today, share some of the tricks we learned along that, uh, that journey and hopefully give some value back. Um, because we didn't learn Houdini on our own, uh, we had a lot of help along the way. So I wanted to give a quick shout out to some of those vital resources that we used. Um, and, you know, this, this incredible how many resources are available on the internet. When I le started learning CG, there wasn't anything like this, so finding community to uh, help you ramp up is fantastic. So a uh, quick warning, there is uh, violence and gore ahead. It's Mortal Kombat, after all. Uh, so I'm about to dive into uh, blood, and uh, you know, fair, fair warning if it's not your cup of tea. So this is what we end up shipping with in MK11. Uh, and this is a, kind of an effort to re-envision what cinematic blood effects could look like in our games. So starting this journey, uh, we were given this kind of previs uh, art direction that we needed to try to hit. So uh, there's a number of key takeaways here. There's just you know the MK ridiculous over over the top quantity of blood. Um, it's rendered close to the camera. There's this slow motion choreography, this impact, and then a slow mo. Um, really wanted to focus on having believable fluid motion. And then there's this high contrast backlit lighting that uh, gives this blood kind of a subsurface look, and we wanted to try to hit that. And then whatever solution we came up to came up with really needed to be art directable. Our fatalities specifically are very heavily scrutinized, so we needed a very flexible system. Uh, so going down the R&D process, we tried a lot of different things: uh, traditional flip books, alpha erosion techniques for VFX. Uh, mesh particles with different vertex shaders on them, and we really, really struggled to get that believable fluid motion. Um, and luckily, Side Effects presented their vertex animation textures technique right around the same time that we were R&Ding this. Um, so hey, thanks for Side Effects for doing some R&D for us. Um, it allowed us to prove out some concepts and kind of, in instead of trying to figure out the visual solution in editor, think about it as an offline solution uh, and bring it into the editor. So. We're able to prototype and prove out some, some process with this, but we ran into a big problem. Uh, these blood effects vary very wildly from frame to frame in terms of point count, so they could start at you know, maybe 500 points and grow into 60,000 points toward the end. So this uh, kind of rectangular texture-based storage medium from this, uh, this pipeline wasn't really optimal. So we consulted with our engineering team, and we ended up going with basically the same pipeline but replacing textures with Alembic. Um, and then storing that in a proprietary editor-based format uh, at runtime. So as, as of right now, we support three main types of what we call geometry caches to allow us to do some of these effects. So the first is the homogenous case, and this is basically a, a uniform frame-to-frame -frame topology. So something like a, a blowing flag in the wind. Um, and you can, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the topology stays the same, frame-to-frame. -frame. So you can do things like inter-frame compression and compress the, the actual animation itself. For blood, however, we've essentially got the heterogeneous case or mesh flipbook. So topology is, can be completely different frame to frame. 
And that presents a unique compression challenge for uh, getting these things down to a budget that is applicable to real-time games. Uh, and then the third, which we'll hit on a little bit later, is what we call a point cache. And this is simply point uh, information coming in through our Cascade Particle Effects tool. So I don't want to dive super deep into the, the kind of the optimization step, but from a high level, you can see this blood effect uh, that 45 frames of animation ends up being about 28 megabytes in game, um, which was too much to justify uh, some of the budgets we were given. So at a high level, we realized that uh, UV data is basically meaningless. There's no effective way to texture these things um, in any kind of efficient, optimized way. So we throw out UVs. If we throw out UVs, we can also strip tangents. We're not going to be normal mapping uh, anything here. So we can get rid of that data payload as well. And then with what's left, uh, we have position, which we can heavily quantize and compress and optimize. So that's what this ends up looking like. Um, these blood effects are chaotic and organic, and, and, and basically any kind of loss in precision uh, that we had via, con uh, via quantizing, uh, we ended up not noticing. So you can see here the shaded mesh is uh, basically a four byte representation for position. The wireframe overlay is the full precision 12 byte. And you can see that they're different when you overlay them, but they're not necessarily worse. Um, so this is a huge win and allow us to, allowed us to cut that position buffer in a third. So in terms of Houdini, these were pretty much straight, straightforward flip simulations. Every blood effect is 45 frames long, and it's got a, a pre-keyframed time warp effect. Um, we don't have a solution for interpolating these meshes yet. It's something we're R&Ding, but um, from there, we just use a standard particle fluid SOP uh, to uh, you know, specifically, uh, they have dilate, erode, and smooth controls. And this really allows us to feed a better uh, topology uh, into the poly reduction stops further down the chain. Um, really helpful if you guys are doing sim stuff. Uh, lattices are great for art directing your simulation after the sim. So don't spend a bunch of time on, on re-simming. Just sculpt it afterwards. Um, from the game dev shelf, there's a delete small parts SOP, which was really cool to uh, just really quickly go in and remove all the little tiny particles of blood that weren't going to poly reduce very well. Um, so that saved a lot of uh, headaches. And then the rest is just a careful poly reduction pass. Um, you can blur position in normal after to kind of smooth out some of the triangulation artifacts frame to frame. You can also do an attribute transfer from the high poly mesh back to the low poly mesh. And that sometimes helps kind of smooth uh, temporal issues um, frame to frame. And here's the end result. So we have what we call our blood library, uh, used for all cinematics across the game. Uh, there's 15 of them. They're persistently loaded in a global overhead memory, uh, which is 155 megabytes, so not a ton of, of room to do this work. Um, so every fatality, fatal blow, and crushing blow in the entire game references these things. Uh, in game, the way we sample this geometry cache is through our shader. So uh, What's really cool is that uh, we have this user channels uh, concept, which is basically uh, vertex data that we can carry along. This can be whatever we want to use it for. It could be vector data. It could be uh, a mask. Um, and it's up to us to figure out how we want to manage that. And so we have full control over how and when we sample the caches. We can do um, interframe interpolation for the, the Hodges case. We can do temporal sampling to kind of uh, smooth out some of the problems you typically have with uh, low, lower res vertex data. Um, and then you can layer uh, procedural math on top of this um, to get even more uh, kind of control. So to shade the blood, uh, we basically mixed a combination of uh, the inverted, uh, basically do a, a raycast from an inverted mesh normal. Um, and then you mix that with some curvature. And uh, basically, what we're left with is a thickness mask. And that gets piped into a user channel. And in our runtime material, we can use that to uh, blend in an emissive, kind of that fake backlit effect. So here's what this looks like in the editor when we're actually editing and setting these things up. They, we spawn them as static meshes. Uh, and so that makes it really easy to position, rotate, art direct how these things look. Uh, you can swap any mesh in the library in for any other mesh, and it just it works. They all fit the same kind of choreography. And then you can add uh, traditional animation keyframing on top of this. So you can you know, slightly rotate the scale or uh, you know, uh, translate it a little bit more 
to kind of add on top of the built-in cache animation. So it was really successful, really easy to use once that library was constructed. Moving on, we have Oceans. Um, so our games always feature a story mode. It's pre-rendered, but it's produced in engine with in-game uh, assets. So while performance considerations are really greatly relaxed, we're still working in a real-time environment. We still need a uh, responsive editor. Uh, we need to fit within GPU memory. So we can't go cr too crazy. Um, but our story mode required oceans that stretched to the horizon, looked good up close, and could fit basically a small fleet of ships. Uh, and then, of course, R&D couldn't start till later in the project. So, um, you know, uh, traditional options of doing uh, like Gerstner waves or FFT, like they just weren't on the, we didn't have the time to do it. So again, Houdini came to the rescue. So here's what we ended up with as an example of one of our oceans. Um, this is pretty straightforward to set up. So the thought process here was to create just a tiling patch of ocean that we could repeat over and over again for the up close. Uh, and the, the, the only real challenge here was to make sure that those patches shaded consistently and there was no seams. Um, and then the idea here was to basically progressively create lower res geometry that, sketched, that stretched out to the horizon. And any displacement that we brought in via that cache would be kind of smoothly blended off uh, towards the distance. And then just traditional uh, procedural deformation and normal maps would kind of take over and kind of blend that transition. So we have basically this skirt mesh that handles that transition between the patches and the uh, horizon. And then we have this, extend this extension mesh that blends all the way out. So here, this was just kind of relying on old school game development tricks to tile things. And this is uh, just take your ocean patch, duplicate it, translate it in all four directions, and then do an attribute transfer just to make sure all the normals and positions on the edges match up. And now you've got a seamless tiling uh, ocean. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, next part was creating that skirt mesh, that transition. So we started by just modeling uh, topo clean topology for the, our vertex count limits that we were working underneath. Um, and basically just pretty simple, create a point group. You can use that point group to inform your poly reduction. Um, so you can see here it fades off. So we've got a one-to-one -one, uh, point match from the grid. And then we basically blend out to the, the outsides. Uh, and so the next step was to basically, now that we've got this clean piece of model geo, transform the ocean displacement uh, from the rest of the system back on. So if there's any Houdini power users in the room, the next slide will make it cringe. Uh, we did that. So uh, not procedural, um, just a whole lot of duplication of our already tiling patches. It's ugly, but it worked. Um, so we just use a ray sop to uh, ray cast and transfer that uh, vertical displacement back down to our clean piece of geometry. And then a simple attribute transfer to uh, bring the normals over. So here is a, 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 just a really straightforward VOP setup. I use that same point attribute, that inside points that we used it for the poly reduction. And all this does is basically smoothly blend to zero displacement and a perfectly straight up normal. Um, at the edges of that skirt, and then we're good to go. So next up, uh, if you're doing any kind of uh, ambient environment effects in real-time games, you need to make things loop a lot. Um, so I wanted to kind of share some quick tricks we learned for looping uh, flip simulations. So on the left is our non-looping non flip, and on the right is the looping uh, resulting VDB. So um, we tried a number of different methods for this specific case. Um, there's a lot of things like on the game dev shell, uh, game tool shelf that allow you to loop different simulations. Um, there's some solutions online. And for some reason, nothing was quite working. There's some little artifacts here and there. Um, I suspect, I haven't do I had time to dive into it too deep yet, but I suspect uh, there's something with the VDB data structure, the optimized structure of those that kind of causes some issues. So our big trick was to basically ultimately convert to a standard Houdini volume, do your, uh, your time shift and your, your volume mix to do the blending, and then convert back to VDB. Um, and then for a lot of our simulations, especially if there's kind of splashes falling off the ends, uh, we really had to be careful with how we keyframed that blend parameter so we didn't have like drips that just disappeared um, and fell off. But pretty straightforward, we used it all over the place. 
So next thing I want to cover really quick is uh, generating wet maps um, and how we accomplish the simulation. So this is on, uh, on one of our fight lines running at 60 hertz in game. So in terms of fluid simulations, again, it's, it's, it's standard flip stuff. Um, if you're working in real-time games, uh, there's a lot of hurdles to jump getting nice, clean geometry for a simulation. Um, so after, after your artists kind of plug and clean up any holes, um, they'll still jam everything together uh, into this big mess. So basically, grab all that stuff, convert it back to a VDB, merge it, convert it back to polys, and now you've got the nice, clean collision surface. Um, the other key thing for pulling off this asset was really trying to simultaneously get this very energetic splash, but kind of constrain the simulation to a small surface area so it's not hitting all the other different assets in the scene. So there's a number of techniques we employed, like placing kill volumes to, to kill particles as they entered, or deleting particles based off different attributes to kind of really wrangle and, and keep this thing uh, somewhat small. Uh, so here we started to generate our wet map. Um, for quick iteration, we really needed to, to uh, reduce this data set only to the points that intersected with the collision geometry. So again, nothing. No, there's no rocket science here. It's just basically establishing a point group of things that, uh, that uh, actually come close to that collision surface. And so you've got this very small contained data set. And then from there, we came up with a, a simple solver setup uh, where we essentially create a wet attribute for the, the liquid, a dry attribute or a wet attribute of zero for the rocks. And then in a solver, we just accumulate frame by frame and do an attribute transfer. So we kind of, over time, build up everything getting wet. So that's what this looks like. Uh, you can see the animation there of, uh, of the sequence. Um, from there, we just use COPS and render out a, uh, an image sequence. We, in this case, had to time warp that image sequence to fit it within this uh, you know, four by four frame flipbook. And then on the engine runtime material, we can interpolate between those frames and basically re-expand out that whole sequence. Um, so it's a pretty nice little trick. Uh, so here we had uh, this request to do lightning. Um, we didn't really have an accurate in-game way to cast these bolts and have accurate collision on the surfaces. Uh, so again, we turned to Houdini. And this was pretty much uh, straightforward procedural modeling stuff. You just take, uh, take your level geometry as an input. Uh, we just picked some random triangles all over the surface, collapse those down to points, generate curves from those points, add some, uh, some jitter, and we get some kind of lightning forms happening here, and then just sweep those curves to get nice, clean game geometry. And the real trick here came from laying out these UVs in a, in a, in a game development, real-time friendly method. Uh, so you can see here that there's, there's a little for each loop that goes through each one of these bolts and cleanly lays out a strip of UVs. Uh, if you're a tech or VFX artist in games, you're probably already thinking of how we're doing this. Uh, so this made it really easy to basically uh, pan a mask in random directions in the U direction, and this basically reveals each bolt of lightning in kind of a random fashion. And then we can pan noise in the V direction and use that to basically drive vertex shaders and add some extra noise and jitter to the lightning at runtime. Uh, so flipbooks. Um, so we have got this level, I'm about to show you in a second what this ends up looking like, but uh, we have this giant rocket launcher in the middle of the level. Um, again, we run at 60 hertz, and they wanted like a giant rocket exhaust uh, smoke plume coming out of this thing that filled the screen. Um, so traditional part of particle effects would have been way too expensive for this, too much overdraw, we wouldn't have uh, hit performance levels. So um, our gameplay camera is basically fixed, it kind of slides back and forth. We never go into the scene very much, and we don't ever really tilt very much. So for this specific challenge, um, I was inspired by uh, Andreas Glad's solution he presented a couple years ago. Uh, it's a tool he calls the Volume Slicer, and this is basically um, manipulating your camera clip planes in Houdini to render uh, progressive slices through volumetric data. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me to learn to author HDAs uh, and figure out that workflow. And then um, I also, it was a good opportunity to basically derive motion vectors from our simulation uh, to extend that simulation out as long as I need it. So here's what we ended up with. Um, so this is kind of representative from our gameplay camera. And 
Again, overdraw, translucent overdraw was a big concern here. So this is what the process ends up looking like. Uh, basically drop down our HDA and uh, basically lock your viewport camera to the HDA camera and you can frame your volume however you want from any angle, doesn't matter. And so this helps kind of preview uh, what your output renders will look like. And then here you've got controls to basically previs where these slices will take place throughout that volume. So the checkerboard is basically the, the front and back of each clipping plane. And then the big quad is uh, a visualization of, of the slice that will render. And then what we can do is uh, go back to the HDA settings and you can previs each active slice. So I can step through that volume and preview uh, exactly what will render out to cards at the end of the day. So if I break camera, you can see in this environment, we ended up with three slices to do that whole effect and just as an incredible cheat. Um, and then the only other thing we did on top for the motion vectors, uh, if anybody's doing this work, um, I love to retime simulations after simulating, so I'm not burning resim time. Um, however, since the motion vectors are calculated based off of the velocities within the volume, if you retime it, you screw up some of the motion vector data. So what I had to do was essentially keyframe, uh, you can see like the, the curve I had to plug in here, but basically keyframe the distortion parameters in my runtime material to counteract that, uh, that time warping. So at the end of the day, it was only three slices. Uh, we had a, a 4K by 2K color map, a 2K by 1K motion vector. This was 64 frames played back over 224 frames. Um, I was really impressed with how far we could stretch this uh, with, with limited data. And then performance wise is about 0.3 milliseconds on Xbox at the worst case. So uh, really, really cheap and effective compared to uh, traditional effects. And then just apply a healthy dose of depth bias to help kind of blend those cards in with the rest of the environment. Um, so we've got some future uh, ideas to kind of improve this workflow and start channel packing data and just get even more efficient with it. Uh, we did a lot of traditional flip books as well. I just wanted to show this quick example, another case where we had a giant translucent effect in the middle of, uh, of the, the gameplay arena. Um, the, the key takeaway here is that Pyro made it really easy to spin off multiple different versions of this simulation. Uh, so I wasn't starting from scratch every time. So there's three different simulations going on here, and the rest is just uh, hand modeling cards to kind of fill up as much volume as possible, um, add a little layer of uh, vertex deformation over top, and fill in a little bit of volume with traditional particle systems. And, and again, a really cheap translucent effect um, right up close to camera. So this is a great example of our point cache pipeline. Um, we needed sparks on this robot and uh, traditional depth buffer collisions in our particle system were not going to be able to handle uh, this type of accuracy. So again, let's fire up Houdini. Um, pretty straightforward uh, pop sim here. Just import the animated game geometry, create your source. We previs everything with normals just so you can actually see those vectors, uh, feed those vectors into our, our pop solver. Um, start colliding with game geometry. Um, we started doing some little simple wrangles to kind of just based off of uh, reference from sparks to kill particles at the appropriate time so they look like they die and burn out appropriately. Um, and then the big trick here was looking again looking at reference. Um, sparks are basically points but if you're looking at them under film condition, there's a healthy amount of motion blur to stretch that spark out and to make it look kind of real. Uh, so we exported uh, all the point velocities through user channels and used that to, to actually stretch the, uh, the sprite geometry in the engine. And then last thing, uh, just some procedural modeling here. This level had thousands of candles that need, all needed candle flames. Uh, there is really no practical way to efficiently author those things by hand. Uh, so we just brought in each cluster of candles in a Houdini, procedurally placed points at the tips, and then use those to spawn, uh, you know, regular sprite flames at the end of the day. So saved us, uh, saved some poor environment artist a ton of time. So that's it. Hopefully you guys could take away some really practical tricks for, for real-time assets uh, that we employed. I'll leave you with the uh, obligatory we're hiring slide, just like everybody else, and uh, ask if you have any questions. Yeah. 
or I got I got I was instructed to throw this at you. So here you go. How large was your team of specifically of VFX artists using Houdini? So it started with two, myself and Aaron. Uh, we really kind of led the charge and evangelized the, the adoption. Um, so that was starting 2006. Now basically everybody uses it. Um, so we have, uh, I would say, an additional five VFX artists that are all using it uh, to various levels. Are so. any of the environment artists? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, one guy picking it up. We're transitioning all of our rigid body simulation pipeline over to Houdini. Um, and then we don't have a ton of environment artists using it just because the, the, the style and the variety of environments we have are so wildly different that it's hard to make uh, procedural tools that accommodate everything. So you're making everything from an alien spaceship to some weird spike pit thing. You know, so. um, but as we go on, there's more and more adoption. Thank you. Yes? Have you uh, done much with uh, Houdini Engine in the game? Any tool development or anything like that? We are constantly evaluating it. Again, we have this kind of unique production issue of like just there's such a wild variety of things that we do. Um, that uh, essentially the, the, in the time it takes to author an HDA and, and, and make some tool in Houdini Engine to do it and then train someone to, to, to actually use the tool, we could have just done the work because um, it's a lot of just one-off unique things. Um, but again, it's something, it's like it's always on the radar. We're ready to flip that switch as soon as we've got the production need for it. So that was, so yeah, so that was just collision geometry that we fed into the simulation. The important part was that the UVs uh, for that were attribute transferred so that we could basically reapply that wetness mass to the actual runtime geometry. All right, I think uh, that's all the time we have. I appreciate everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>